We're moving on to item uh, 4.4 on the agenda, the Strong Workforce Task Force uh, Recommendations and Implementation. Uh, Chancellor. Thank you, uh, President Baum, members of the board. Uh, it's a pleasure to bring forward to you an item uh, that you requested. Thank you. Um, and you'll get this in two tranches. Uh, Vaughn will give you the sort of 30,000 foot view in, of implementation today, and then uh, she will be back to you at a subsequent meeting to drill down into more detail with a, uh, a uh, uh, accountability tracking measure for uh, this work. So it's a pleasure to introduce Vaughn. Vaughn? Thank you, Chancellor Harris, uh, President Baum, and members of the board. Uh, so since uh, November's approval of these 25 recommendations, we have been organizing uh, for the implementation phase. I wanted to share uh, a number of the steps that have been completed up to this point, and then share with you where we are making visible the whole project plan so that all can follow our progress. Uh, Clearly, um, it's a very complicated uh, set of implementation to ensure that campuses receive your signals, uh, policy signals, uh, when they are planning their campus, uh, use of campus resources. So uh, since your approval back in November, uh, you had asked us to define whether each recommendation requires legislative, budgetary, regulatory, or administrative action. And we have gone through and done that for every sub-bullet of the 25 recommendations, so 84 line items with our, uh, um, and so we've, we've marked whether it takes one or more of these actions. Uh, we have also assigned a lead vice chancellor per item uh, so, so that, that that chancellor, vice chancellor has the lead baton. So, so some of these recommendations require three, three divisions, for example, to work together. Uh, so Pam Walker, Denise Nolden, myself, on some others require, you know, the uh, TRIS division with its, its data systems. Uh, so it's, it's not a very simple uh, one organization uh, path forward, but there needs to be a vice chancellor with a, uh, a lead baton. Uh, on the third bullet, for those items where we had a big budget ask and a legislative ask, we moved them into processes owned by uh, Vice Chancellor Stewart and Vice Chancellor Troy. So you saw the uh, realization of the fiscal request through the $200 million in the governor's budget. And in the legislative proposal, uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Stewart will brief you on Senate Bill 66 uh, Leva that is carrying a number of our uh, requests especially re regarding aligning metrics to the federal WIOA requirements, as well as the data sharing that uh, recommendation. Fourth bullet, we needed some capacity, so we built a technical assistance provider team with help of uh, College of the Canyons. We loaned us some resources, and so now we have a team to do project management, coordination, and communication. We also reconstituted our advisory body uh, to bring in and uh, into the fold more of the members of the task force or uh, seats from the from the task force, and that includes, you know, all the standing members of uh, of the system, like chief business officer, chief student success officer, etc., uh, uh, along with classified faculty, uh, CTE deans. But they also have ten industry sector representatives, labor representatives, youth advocacy reps, so similar voices to the table. And then we launched this website, which I think will be helpful uh, to you to visualize all this work. So this was your Strong Workforce Task Force website. And if you see in the golden box on the bottom, available to everybody now, are if you tech, uh, the, the members of the technical assistance team with their emails, the advisory body, who's on it, and then the project plan update. So now I'm going to deep dive into the project plan update to show you. So in your document, what you see is that on the website, when you click any of the 25 recommendations, it will break out and show you whether it's legislative action, administrative action, or budgetary, or regulatory. And it shows you the vice chancellor name associated with it. At a future point, we'll also indicate uh, the timing. Okay? So this level of detail is available on the website. 
but with you, so then we rolled that up into just the 25 to show you in, in this version. So um, when you see on page 25, uh, you will see that under workforce data and outcomes, number 456 map back to the prior page. So the sub bullets were on the prior page and then they roll up in aggregate into the subsequent page. So on 4A, you will hear more about the legislative strategy from Vince Stewart. On 4B, we hope to come back to you with a discussion of the accountability and outcomes, uh, progress that we have made. Uh, 5A, you'll hear from, um, it will be the same report from uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Stewart. So as we make these progress, we'll begin updating and we'll, we'll, we'll attempt to use some visuals so that you know uh, the, the timing as well as uh, whether or not we have begun the implementation phase. So on each of these pages, uh, I'll also note that in the implementation requires us to work with a lot of existing bodies. Uh, we've had meetings with the Academic Senate clearly on all these uh, curriculum recommendations as well as CTE faculty. It would require a tremendous partnership with the Academic Senate uh, and with our Academic Affairs Division uh, as, long, as well as uh, information from the field. And so there's a lot of work uh, and discussions within the Senate. And you will see, uh, and same thing going on to regional coordination. There's a lot of existing parties and we're going through one by one. So I guess maybe the bottom line is that we're working through the project plan. Some of these project plans are fairly complicated, um, but we're attempting to identify who's accountable. We're really working hard on the data and the metrics. And at the bottom line is, you know, in order for us to filter your policy objectives down to the campus planning, we need to make sure that the data, the metrics, and the monies are all aligned and the enabling structures are in place for the colleges to really focus on these policies. So lots of details available and I'm happy to answer in, in any, any one of these items. Thank you but very much the for, for this update. Are there any members of the public that wish to address the board on this item? We have one, uh, Larry Galusio from the League. <laughs> President Baum, uh, Vice President Estolano, Chancellor Harris, members of the board. So sometimes you sort of sneak around in, a, in, a, in an item, in an agenda item, because the time is getting short. And uh, it does relate, because obviously the League is very eager to work with all of you and all our partners. Um, the last item on the budget, this item is going to require a great deal of work from all of us as we approach the legislative session. And so apropos of that, um, I, I wanted to comment on this item and also two invitations. Uh, and one is for tonight. I wanted to remind all of you that tonight, the League along with ACA and ACBO will be having a, um, a reception um, kicking off the, the legislative session and all of this work tonight at the Mix, which is on L Street, where I've never, I've never been to the Mix, but would invite all of you, it's tonight between 5.30 and 7.30, uh, supporting our colleges so we can talk more about uh, these important issues. So that's one reason I wanted to get up here. Secondly, um, I wanted to reinforce Chancellor Harris's observation about the importance of and the accomplishment of being able to track the data. I was just at a meeting of my peers uh, throughout the United States and was approached by someone from ACCT who will be doing the Chancellor's search and they were saying that because of what California is doing in terms of tracking student data, they want to uh, work very closely with us uh, for, for grant monies and because you can really do and make data formed analyses and decision making. So it is really a tremendous a tremendous accomplishment. Um, uh, one more item is um, the our annual legislative conference uh, takes place from January 31st to February 1st. And in addition to talking about 
all of this important work, uh, strong workforce. Uh, a familiar name, Dr. Martha Cantor, has agreed to fly out the former assistant undersecretary of, of, from the Department of Education and, more importantly, former chancellor from Foothill De Anza. She will be um, at the conference, and we will be essentially unveiling the California Promise, which is the California um, response to uh, President Obama's you know, America's promise, and the reason, you know, because of all the great work that you've done with the Board of Governors uh, fee waivers, we are unique. And the problem in terms of access for many students is textbook costs, living costs, transportation, and apropos to your question, um, uh, Member Perry, we are talking about Chief and working second. closely with Vice Chancellor um, Stewart and others to really increase and expand the Cal Grant because that's a major barrier. So I would invite all of you tonight to come to the mix, how we're, you know, to strategize on this work, and also for our legislative conference in uh, preparation so we Time. can have the strongest advocacy possible for our work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have no further public comment requests. Questions or comments from members of the Board of Governors? Um, Member Malumet. Well, thank you. This is very exciting. Um, the question I have in my mind is, all of a sudden, people are saying um, from the healthcare field, from the Congress, uh, from the Cal states, oh, we have these thoughts. We want to work with the community college students and start having certain pipelines and start integrating them down, uh, our programs down into there. So are you able to um, accept people as the years go by accept new programs? I'm just kind of wondering about that. Are the things you're thinking about now um, able to be very flexible, I guess is what I'm asking. So we had a trial run two years ago when the governor had put 50 million in CTE uh, equipment monies into the system uh, in order to, for the colleges to retool and upgrade their CTE program. And we did do a count. I mean, 326,567 students are going to be impacted by us working on retooling that. And in the last few years, thanks to your support of the Doing What Matters for Jobs and Economy infrastructure, we really, we have people on the ground working now on point to help our colleges and its faculty better connect with the um, employers. So when I was up uh, in um, DC in the White House, Actually, they have in on their radar a number of our efforts. So our tech hire program, our, our progress in the information communication technology space has gotten to their radar. Our healthcare programs on their radar, their agriculture programs on their radar, the apprenticeship programs on their radar, and they were most excited about the progress we made on data and accountability. They are actually, we're pulling ahead of the pack um, at the national level, showing other states how, it, uh, how we're doing that work in terms of showing students and their workforce outcomes, um, how are they doing in terms of impacting wage and then job placement as well. So we, we, we would like to come back to you and show the progress that is being made on the accountability front. Uh, but yes, we're, by, by, with your championship, uh, we're able to signal to the system the importance of this uh, policy area and put the monies against it too. Well, I, I appreciate your leadership, oh, go ahead. Uh, your leadership and the, and the chancellor's leadership on this. How many times have you been invited to the White House for a major uh, 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 presentation on this? A, a few times, but, but, but what was really rewarding about this time was how many times California was mentioned. And just to compare and contrast, when I came in this job, all of these workforce programs were cut in half and put into flex, right? So it was at a diminished state at that point, and thanks to your championship, we're really being able to, able to elevate it. Yeah. Vice President Estolano. Yeah, um, thank you for this report, and thank you for the table. It's exactly what I was hoping for, and I want to actually address my, my fellow board members in that, um, it's notable that very few of the recommendations require legislative changes. By and large, um, we can accomplish this through administrative and regulatory changes. <clears throat> and when we look at regulatory, that means us going through first and second readings of Title V. Um, and this is something where I'm hoping that uh, Vice Chancellor 
um, Tom Quinlivan will give us a timeline for to move speedily along the things we can control as the Board of Governors. You know, we, we set out a very ambitious agenda and a very ambitious timeline to get the task force to meet and to seek comment and to come back with recommendations in like nine months it was pretty amazing. Um, now we have to do our part and keep the progress moving. So I want to commend you for this very, very clear um, table and let you know I'm going to be hopping on your website um, once Larry lets us go from the uh, reception and, uh, and look forward to looking to your updates on a regular basis. I have a quick question. Yes, Member Reed. Yes. Uh, you mentioned job, job placement, and to me that's a key issue, you know, once the student has the training and whatnot. Are, are we seeing across the board where campuses are developing uh, sites where, where there is real job placement once, once they've completed a, a coursework, like the, maybe the universities do where they place their students after they've graduated? I mean... So th there's a two-part strategy to that. Uh, the Strong Workforce recommendation recommended uh, career exploration early and often, work-based learning, so that a, a, a student comes out with experience as well as formal training. And then integration with the workforce system so that the collectively we can do a better job working with employers to get uh, job placement. So there's momentum, but there's a lot of Oh, more work to be done on all of those fronts. Can I comment on, on that as well? Member Avalos. Um, like I mentioned before, um, you know, in my 25 uh, tours of the different community colleges, when I talk about, you know, the career centers that they have there, the career centers are career exploration, right? But, but for CTE, it's so important to have job placement. So to me, it's like, how are we investing some of this money to make that change? Because ultimately, you know, the, these, these uh, CT students, when they complete their degree, they need employment, yes, right? Yes. They don't have the luxury of, you know, of going to a job board, for the most part, to find jobs, right? So the question is, how can we help them? That's right, to make it systematic, right? Great, thank you very much for that update, and we look forward to getting regular updates uh, throughout the, uh, the course of the year. Uh, we're moving on to our next item, 4.5. Before we do that, I did neglect to uh, uh, report something out uh, on one of our previous votes. Uh, when we voted on contract and grants, I did not recognize that Member Burdick abstained on the contracts that uh, were specifically connected to his, his home district, the State Center College District. And so I wanted to note his abstention on the contracts that we voted on, the, on previously. We now move on to item 4.5, the Student Equity Program. Um, Chancellor. Thank you, uh, President Ball, members of the board. The next two items, uh, the Student Equity Plan and the Equal Opportunity Report, are going to be presented in tandem uh, by Vice Chancellors uh, um, Nolden and uh, Nguyen. So uh, I would uh, ask that uh, they move forward. This is a report. These are both reports the board has asked for previously. I would, uh, I would say to the board that in, in case of the equity program specifically, as well as the uh, uh, EEO report, that these are both uh, sort of in their infancy. These uh, equity uh, plans have just been uh, provided to us from the colleges in the last month or so. So this really is a preliminary view, and, and you can and should expect uh, us to come back to you uh, later this year with a much more detailed report in both of these areas. So with that, I'll turn it over to Vice Chancellor Norman. Okay, I'm going to now give you the sort of the state of where we are with student equity um, within um, our system. Um, but I know that we have some members who may not have had the um, uh, opportunity to find out how we got here. So I did provide a little bit of background for you in this PowerPoint to tell you about student equity and, and um, particularly to point out that student equity is not something that's new to our system. Uh, many of you know that um, back in 1992, the Board of Governors adopted a student equity policy initially to ensure that historically underrepresented groups of students have equal opportunity for access and success. And we um, go through this timeline to see that over time, the Board uh, amended its policy in 1996 to establish the adoption of a minimum uh, requirement, a minimum standard for receipt of, uh, excuse me, state funding that a student equity plan be submitted by each college. And then to 2002, 
the recommendations of the Task Force on Equity and Diversity uh, provided uh, Title V regulation, regulations for helping colleges to develop their student equity plans to 2003, where the Chancellor's Office uh, provided guidelines for the development of those plans. And then the Chancellor's Office in 2005 asked colleges to update on a uh, regular basis uh, the completion of those student equity plans. 2008 and 9 to 2012 and 13, the submission of, of the plans was suspended due to the budget uh, cuts, and then we moved to th 2012, the Student Success Act, uh, SB 1456, which reaffirmed the, the student equity goals that the uh, Board of Governors initially um, established. And with the Student Success Act, then we had um, language that um, the board again required the colleges to develop to develop a, in their uh, student success and support program a plan that reflects um, the college's identifying strategies to monitor and address equity issues and to mitigate disproportionate impact on student access and achievement. So it really specifically said that there was some direct action that colleges needed to take in order to mitigate this disproportionate impact. Um, SB 8, and at that point, uh, the Chancellor's Office developed uh, an initial template and guidelines for colleges to follow. Um, SB 860 was enacted, which changed what colleges were required to do. So once the initial template was put out, we had to go back and take a look at how do we add uh, the subsequent requirements to those plans. And because of the timeline and, uh, that was initially established for those plans to be submitted, many of the plans had already been completed before they could address all of the um, aspects of a SB 860. So we did have to come up with a means of allowing those colleges to add those aspects to their plan. Um, so we um, did that, uh, and I'll talk a little bit, sorry, I I'll talk a little bit more about how um, we, we did that. Um, the student equity funding that came to us initially was in June of 2014, and there was $70 million appropriated. And it required that the colleges coordinate with other categorical programs on the development, development of these plans, that they include faculty, student services, and other constituencies. So they wanted to make sure that there was a lot of collaboration and inclusiveness um, in terms of the development of the plans. And they also targeted uh, groups that needed to be included uh, in terms of measuring disproportionate impact. So they wanted to make sure that if disproportionate impact was found among these groups, that there would be special efforts um, developed to address the uh, mitigating the disproportionate impact and closing the achievement gaps. In June of 2015, there was an additional um, $85 million on top of the 170 uh, appropriated for student equity efforts. So as you can see, in a very short period of time, colleges got a great deal of funding to deal with student equity and uh, closing achievement gaps. And yet, one of the challenges that colleges faced is that if they really knew how to do that, they would have probably already been engaged in this work. So a lot of time had to be spent on trying to get colleges in the position where they could gather evidence and gather uh, strategies so that they could develop a ways to uh, intervene with the student populations that they were found to have uh, disproportionate impact. In some cases, colleges did not have um, research capabilities to even do the studies. And so while the money came to them, they had to really just gear up and, and try to develop a, a strategy for developing the plan. So that's really how the first year was spent. Um, again, I talked about the populations, and I have highlighted in red here those populations that were added after the initial language came out about the development of the plan. So in addition to the populations in the first iteration of the plan, they had, uh, colleges had to add these other groups and determine if disproportionate impact um, existed um, within and among uh, these groups. And so we have the added groups in red, uh, some other race, more than one race, current or former foster youth, low-income students, and veterans. So even if you had done that in your initial plan, now you had to go back and add that other set of research to determine if those newly added groups um, were disproportionately impacted. The collaboration piece I talked about, 
Um, I don't know how many of you have worked on college campuses, but when you're talking about getting all of these required constituents together, especially if you're in an environment where you really weren't working together in that way, um, there were some challenges that colleges experienced, but um, I will say having traveled around the state to look at some of the ways in which colleges are collaborating, I've been really, really impressed because there are people that probably had never really worked together that are now working together on behalf of really coming up with some specific and targeted interventions. But um, the required constituencies are listed there, the Senate, the uh, faculty and staff, student services representatives, students, as well as community members. And we require that the plans be reviewed by the Board of Trustees and also to have in the plan a description of how you planned. You know, what was your planning process? Because we wanted to make sure that all of the groups had an opportunity to participate in the planning process. The other um, challenging area, I think, at, at least in the short period of time that I've been here, is that um, the concept of equity was something that was new to folks. Um, many folks saw it as just advancing equality, and many of the uh, folks who do research on student equity point out that equity and equality are not the same, and so you have to sort of kind of un unravel that for people and help them to understand what equity really means. And it really means that instead of looking at what our students bring and, and looking at our students in terms of how they may not have what it takes to be successful, looking at our institutions and the practices that we may be engaged in that may be pr promoting that lack of success with, you know, within and among student populations. So what a, a lot of things that were done in the first year were to help colleges to really grapple and understand the concept of equity and how to apply it to the work that we were doing. So there were many planning institutes and um, planning with uh, internal and external system partners. We, we partnered with our colleagues in the Academic Senate who were just fabulous in terms of holding institutes and helping to uh, advance the notion of equity um, among uh, in, in, uh, faculty. We, ha we partnered with the League, uh, Tweed, when uh, Tweed was with the League, we had a, a wonderful conference there, and I know that work with the League continues, as well as other professional development opportunities and training. And what we did do is we allowed colleges to ask us if they could travel out of state, because there are a lot of these efforts going on nationally, and we wanted to give colleges the opportunity to be able to do that. So we think we advanced the understanding of equity quite well. What we did when we got the plans last year, um, we received them, most of them on, on January 1st, we determined that reviewing 113 plans with you know, a couple of staff assigned to do this review was just not going to work. We knew that we had to do some revamping of the template and the plan submission process. So what we did was we decided to have a peer review process. And so we did that last March. We reviewed. Uh, with a panel of 30 readers, all of the plans, and we had uh, 10 teams with three readers each, and they each reviewed uh, 11 to 12 plans. And I really want to thank the volunteers. They ended up thanking us because they learned a lot by reviewing plans. I think there was a lot of self-interest in that review process because they wanted to see what other folks were doing. So, but we really got a lot of feedback from that from the colleges on you know what they thought the strengths and weaknesses were in the plans, and it really gave them time to really think deeply about how they would proceed with the uh, updated plan for 1516. And so, some of the feedback that we received through that process was that we needed to change the plan template to give much clearer instructions and directions to the colleges, um, really have expenditure guidelines in there and a really um, kind of a cohesive way to, for them to report out and evaluate the work that they were doing. So we took all of that information back and um, we developed uh, a new plan. <laughs> so uh, in that new template, we were able to include the new criteria for the target populations and coordinate and collaborate um, on the budget and, and the reporting process and to standardize the content and create a common look and feel of the plans. The initial plans did not have a common look and feel and you really didn't know in some cases that you were reading plans about student equity. So we, we uh, feel like the plans that we just recently received uh, were plans that really looked like they were all addressing the same topic and we really feel like um, this next review will be um, far more fruitful in terms of the information we'll be able to glean in, in terms of what colleges are doing. 
Um, we talked earlier about you know, um, the guidelines for measuring disproportionate impact. One, one of the things that happened when the dollars went out, the, the resources went out to the field, is that we had to make it very, very clear that the student equity dollars were to be spent on measuring and reducing disproportionate impact among the populations, particularly those that were called out. And there were, there were three options for doing that. And, and earlier, uh, you were looking at some of the um, information from some of the reporting that Chancellor Harris talked about. And by giving them options for reporting out how they, they measure and um, track disproportionate impact, it really gave the colleges a lot of leeway. As I mentioned earlier, many of them didn't have research capacity, so this allowed them to pick the option that worked best for them in terms of determining which groups were disproportionately impacted. So here are the three uh, options. Um, the plan elements, we you know, really, really clarified uh, how, how the goals should be developed and that they should be specific and measurable and uh, have a success indicator for each student group. They should be reasonable and achievable, uh, include a baseline year and baseline, baseline data and target dates. And you know, I'm listening as the conversation went on earlier and we'll make sure that we include the type of metrics that you're looking for so that you don't have to guess about that. One of the things I should have mentioned in the previous slide is that one of those um, measure metrics in particular allows you to get at that number. How many, st how many more students, and I'll, I'll credit Gregory Stout from the Contra Costa Community College District. He really has a, he did a great presentation for us at training to help us to understand just how many students would have to improve on this particular metric for this group not to be disproportionately impacted. So it's a lot easier rather than saying 5.8% uh, that you know that 18 African American males can improve on this metric and then uh, we would know that we would be hitting our target, whichever one of those targets that you were indicating. So we, we had the, um, the colleges to really not just give us what they thought we would accept, but to really think de deeply about how are you going to move the needle on helping these, th these student populations? Because frankly, if you don't move the needle for those populations, other populations can improve, but those populations will keep you where you don't want to be, which is not meeting those uh, metrics that you need to meet in order for those groups not to be disproportionately impacted. So we um, tried to give a little bit of latitude too, not to be too lockstep, but to allow colleges some flexibility in terms of you know, how they set their goals. But um, one of the things that I think that we did is that we were just a lot clear in terms of the direction that we were providing them in, in terms of what we wanted, wanted to see in the plans. Our next steps, uh, we're going to February 1st review the 15-16 equity plans. We have a group of volunteers who are going to come up and, and convene and um, work together to provide feedback to the colleges on the equity plans. We're going to convene the student equity advisory group because they're going to work with us on a report that will be done so that the next time someone comes before you talking about student equity, you'll have concrete data that the colleges will let submit it to us so that you can see how well we're doing on moving the needle. Um, we're going to review the formula for allocation um, because we saw some kind of wildly divergent things happening with the allocation process and so we want to make sure that we're being as equitable as we possibly can in, in the allocation of the funds and um, make uh, recommendations for the template. Uh, well, I just mentioned that. So th those are our next steps in terms of the process. Okay, so then we're going to go on straight to uh, Vice Chancellor Nguyen, and then we'll open it up for questions and public comment. Good afternoon, members, Chancellor, colleagues. Uh, you have on your desk uh, the EO report that I will be doing along with uh, Ms. Sherry Wright, who is the Director of HR for uh, MiraCosta. And uh, if I may here, give me just one second. As uh, Vice Chancellor Denise Nolden uh, told you, the colleges are identifying and implementing the strategies uh, to close the achievement gap. And indeed, uh, Dr. Nolden and her staff are also providing a lot of technical assistance around achieving that. But we at the State Chancellor's Office felt it was also important to infuse the conversation, uh, one of very proven strategy in closing the achievement gap, and that is faculty diversity. Uh, we know studies, we, many faculty members and others will tell you that just anecdotally from their own experiences, faculty diversity matters in closing the achievement gap. 
But most recently, there has been a publication in the American Economic Review by a uh, department chair of the economics department at UC Santa Cruz, and he actually studied one of our colleges, De Anza College, to prove that the achievement gap closes from 20 to 50 percent. Um, one, the, his study, he started out the study asking some of these critical questions about how does it, uh, does it close the achievement gap and to what extent and to what extent it matters with regards to African American students and Latino students. And this is the result of his study. Uh, uh, in terms of raw data, it was uh, close to 500,000 data points. Uh, De Anza College is about 22,000 students and the study was five years. Uh, of work uh, of what the achievement gap looked like for our students. And what you see here uh, is just an astounding 50% closing of the achievement gap in terms of students dropping that course, just alone. And you see at every data point, the achievement gap closes uh, when it is taught by, when the course is taught by an underrepresented faculty member. What was also astounding is the long-term effects. So not only the impact of closing the achievement gap for that course, that instructor, it also went beyond that course, that instructor. Um, the number of students receiving awards, degrees, the majors they're in, for instance, if taught by a science uh, minority instructor, the student is more likely to major in that subject area by that instructor. Transfers also, uh, the gap also closed for transfers. So all around positive effects in every regard, both for that course and long term. So this is his conclusion, strong, positive, robust uh, minority interaction effects. Uh, particularly what's also very interesting is he saw the gap close uh, for African American and Latino students, whether they're taught by an African American or Latino instructor, but the impact was largest, the gain was largest when uh, for an African American student taught by an African American instructor. That was the largest gain, uh, but it didn't matter whether it was for African American students or Latino students. Um, the evidence was also very interesting. Um, you know, a lot of times when we have this conversation about faculty diversity, there's always this notion, could it be that the instructor is reacting differently to students of color, right? So easier grading, et cetera, et cetera. So he actually pulled out all those courses that had more subjective grading, so to speak, yeah, uh, and, and instead kept ones that are more, you know, uh, multiple choice, et cetera, et cetera and still found positive effect. In fact, there was no difference in those two types of courses. Uh, so clearly, this is a study if you wish to study more uh, about what he concluded. Uh, we know this already. We also know that you know, faculty diversity and diversity in general uh, really benefits the institution and increases the overall institutional effectiveness. It's not just the impact on the students, but the impact on the team. Uh, this is a study done by McKinsey, um, and it's in the private sector, but it shows uh, companies outperforming the median um, of, um, of uh, you know, uh, quintile performances, 15% if it's gender diverse, 35% if it's ethnically diverse. So uh, this is also part and part, part of the reason why our institutional effectiveness group has also been very involved in helping us promote this idea. And this is why we are doing this. If you take a look at our data currently, and this is something I know you've seen before, I know Chancellor has been, in fact, I learned about this when he was, before I even came to the Chancellor's office, because he presented this data at the CEO conference, Northern Southern CEO conference, and he said, CEOs, take a look at this data. Our students are becoming more diverse, and yet our faculty uh, ranks are, st are, are still uh, at the 20%. This is for underrepresented minorities. Um, I asked our MIS group to, uh, with the underrepresented minorities, just give me the total, because the previous chart was about first time hire, right? So it looks at that year and first time hire. And I asked our MIS group, and thanks to Vice Chancellor, I'm still gonna call her Vice Chancellor Alice, uh, that uh, she gave me, uh, her team gave me, and it still showed a clear flat line for the last 10 years. Um, our faculty is still at 20, 21%. And contrary to popular belief, our adjunct faculty is actually less diverse than our full-time faculty. Um, 
you know, the, the, the previous chart looked at underrepresented minority, and in the higher ed world, there's a certain definition of that, but I also, you know, we recognize the increased number of mixed race students and, and Asian American students not being monolithic. I asked our MIS to just give me the full picture of that. And uh, as you see, our faculty did increase, but also our student demographics increased. In, in fact, the gap increased from 30% now to 40%. So we still have a lot of work to do in this arena. However, at the same time, now giving you all the bad news of what has been happening in the last 10 years, um, at the same time, we have a window of opportunity, right? Uh, this window of opportunity is reflected in a potential of 1,100 new full-time faculty hired this year uh, alone, and we think it's going to be increased uh, um, also for the next few years. And part of that is the $60 million that we did receive um, in the budget uh, on to hire full-time faculty member. You may recall some of our uh, colleagues came up and asked uh, why, why not for next year in the budget, but this was the one for this year's budget. And of course, colleges are recovering from the budget cuts and uh, the, the obvious retirement with the baby boom, et cetera. Uh, this again is not just with uh, faculty. We're also talking about classified professionals and administrators, uh, but we're particularly focused. You'll notice I, I came right after Dr. Denise Nolden because we're very focused on the achievement gap and we see some evidence around faculty diversity with regards to closing the achievement gap. That's why we're focused on that. So the Chancellor's Office in the last few months has accelerated the work around faculty diversity statewide, and I call it the four legs. So one is professional development, and I'll go through it a little bit more later, peer review of the EO plans, uh, a pipeline program that we're thinking of called the AA to MA Faculty Diversity Pathway Program. And the last one is we actually changed the EEO allocation fund, and I'll explain more of th that later. You'll, al you'll also notice, uh, true to being a lawyer, I cited the various Title V regulations and education code because the work that we're doing is anchored in your own role as a regulatory body. So I want you to fully appreciate the regulations you have put in place to be able to do, for us to do this. Um, the first initiative, uh, the professional development, we did three statewide webinars. Uh, last year, and we also did a summit, and this is to credit Dr. Pam Walker, who came up with the idea of a summit. Of course, the chancellor upped it and said, I don't want one summit, I want two summits so more people can come to the summits. And so we therefore did have that. Chancellor uh, Harris spoke very cogently at the Northern Cal Summit about the need for this, uh, and of course, our vice, chance, uh, our vice chair, uh, uh, Cecilia Estelano spoke at the Southern Cal uh, Summit talking about that window of opportunity and if we don't take advantage of that window of opportunity, it could close and close very soon. Uh, but as a consequence of the work that we did on the professional development, the colleges asked us to do more so they could come to these trainings. And so we just added on uh, for January and February seven regional trainings. So these are some pictures of two of the regional trainings that we've already conducted and we're conducting more. LA Community College was additionally not on the list, but then they said, Twe, we are going to be hiring 200 more uh, positions, uh, new positions, can you just do one for LA? So we said, well, as long as you open it up for everyone in your region, that's okay. So we just added LA very recently. Um, one of the things that we do in the training, uh, the professional development is around the screening committees. It's very critical. Your Title V reg said that the screening committees must be trained prior to them serving on the hearing com um, on these committees. And I, I really credit your two officers, board officers who said, you know, granted we may, may not need to do that for the board in the hiring of the chancellor, uh, but President Baum said, I would like the full board to also do what we are expecting of our colleges. So thank you, President Baum, for that. And you'll see that tomorrow at the board meeting. At our training, we talk about two things, and it's very critical. It's two sides of the co same coin with regards to EEO law. The first one is laws that prohibit discrimination, and you all know about those types of laws, right? Uh, but many uh, are not aware that under Title V and Ed Code, there are also EEO laws that require us to promote inclusion, inclusion, not just don't discriminate, but actually make it an affirmative effort to promote inclusion. Um, so that's our message. This is the Ed Code provision. The second initiative is a review of the EO plan, and 
Uh, we are so fortunate to have co-chair of our EO and Diversity Advisory Committee, Sherry Wright, and she is leading the charge of all our HR folks to uh, do this part, so I'm going to ask her to speak to so it. Thank you, Tui. It's a pleasure. To, I'm proud to be here to represent the HR and EEO professionals in our state that do this great work. And I had to chuckle at the comments earlier about how hard it is to change Title V. I am a witness to that from the time that we began a ground-up effort to modernize these EEO regulations and a partnership with the Chancellor's Office was developed. From that time, it was nearly seven years before the new regulations took effect. But I would say that that journey is worthwhile and that we have more modernized regulations and we hope to uh, bear the fruit of those as we see some of these hiring processes be completed now. So um, I want to give you a quick overview of some of the requirements that the EEO plans must contain. They are adopted by the Board of Governors, a uh, board at each district. Uh, they're required to be reviewed at least once every three years. It includes a lot of different requirements, including notices that go out to community organizations to help solicit um, them to help uh, steer candidates our way. And then one of the new requirements from the new regulations is that there's a longitudinal analysis of your data. So rather than taking a single year snapshot of what was the diversity of the hiring just in one year, to look over that longitudinal basis to see what kinds of patterns and successful efforts have resulted in trying to move those needles. And then uh, the next slide, similar to what um, Denise said about the student equity plans, there was sort of a, um, a pause in, in the emphasis in this efforts during the categorical flexibility time when there was not funds, but at last count, about 60% of the districts have uh, currently submitted an EEO plan to the Chancellor's Office. Um, and so we know that there are a lot of districts that need some extra assistance, and that's the idea of this peer review process, because some of those plans were submitted prior to the time that the new regulations took effect, and so we need to help them make sure that they revise their plans. So we'll be leading a team of HR professionals very similar to the processes that was used for the student equity plans to have neighbors review the plans from some of their neighboring districts and give them assistance in getting to compliance with the new regulations. So we'll be doing that training. Some, some of the plans have already been submitted. We'll be um, training those peer reviewers and then complete that process um, this summer. The third initiative is very new. Um, it's basically the idea, you saw the chart, our students are very diverse. Why don't we um, encourage our own diverse, talented students to come back and teach at the community colleges. So the idea is the AA to MA faculty diversity pathway, and I'm so appreciative of the State Academic Senate to partner with us and anchor uh, this project. They are bringing also uh, other strategic partners such as the CIO board, the uh, HR group, ACRO, and the league to help us think through, design this program. Um, so uh, more to come on that, but be on the lookout that we're very also looking at the long-term efforts uh, of diversifying our faculty through our own students. The fourth initiative is something we just implemented uh, and announced in December, and that is this notion of we can't ex do the same thing over and over and expect different results. And so we have to look at what are we currently doing that we can actually kind of move and change. And one of, the is, it's, one of it is the way we fund EEO. So we have a fund allocation, and it, the work was anchored with the EEO and diversity, a long-term committee uh, by the state chancellor's office. Currently, uh, under Title V, we allocate uh, full-time, we f allocate the EEO fund uh, based on FTES. So the bigger you are, the more you get, et cetera. But we, what we found is uh, the money is about $767,000 each year annually budgeted. But we also discovered something that's exciting is that we have a one-time amount of money in fund penalty because of the unfreezing of, uh, with the budget situation, it was frozen, now the budget is better. It has been unfrozen. And also every year there's a certain amount of uh, penalty that is paid in, in fund uh, violation. And so with that one-time money, um, we thought, let's change things around a little bit. And so what you'll notice under your own regulations, that there is a third way of allocating the funds, and that is to allocate it based on amount related to success in promoting EEO. 
multiple methods of measuring success. So now it's looking at performances of certain activities that we know will be successful. And so we identified those nine multiple methods. Um, so this year, uh, really quickly, is we basically, to kind of ease the transition, because we can't just turn off the lights really quickly and turn it off in another way. So to ease the transition, we had the FTES partly. And then wow, with $45,000, we are requiring that each college meet six of the nine multiple methods. Um, and that it must be certified by the di local district uh, advisory committee, their own CEO. So the thought is to have the colleges be accountable to themselves around uh, their efforts in EEO. And then the next year is when we will completely follow uh, the multiple method, uh, multiple uh, method, method uh, instead of FTES. So that will change uh, permanently moving forward. The nine multiple methods are based on best practices in HR and are, um, I'm gonna ask uh, Sherry to uh, quickly go through that part. So the, the idea is to, if you have best practices in all the various phases of the hiring process, mm -hmm. that hopefully will have a different outcome. So the, what we call the pre-hire phase of things, the, uh, the first item that's underlined is in order to compete for these funds from the EEO fund, the district must have in place an advisory committee and have an EEO plan. That's sort of the price of admission to start with. And then they must um, be able to certify that they are providing five of the remaining eight uh, multiple measures in order to get some of those funds. So the next one would be as a demonstration of the institution's commitment to diversity, that there are board policies, the board may have adopted uh, resolutions regarding diversity efforts. A district may provide incentives for some hard to hire disciplines and do some things to ensure that you have not only a deep but a very diverse applicant pool. Uh, it might be providing um, advantages in district-owned housing, for example, to attract um, people, let's say, in STEM areas or some of the other hard-to-fill positions, and that it would focus some efforts and put money into advertising those positions in publications that speak specifically to underrepresented populations, again, to try and get a diverse applicant pool. Then in the hiring process, we want to ensure that multiple steps are taken to promote inclusion, as Twee mentioned. So there would be procedures for addressing diversity throughout those uh, stages of the hiring process. And that's to ensure that there's a constant analysis of procedures, identifying gaps, and then making improvements to ensure that um, diversity is not just about how you go about advertising, but throughout the stage of doing those um, hires. And that the, then that there is consistent and ongoing training for hiring uh, people who participate in that process, those four elements that we just showed you. Um, is consistently provided to everyone that participates. And yet we also know it's important once you do hire diverse individuals that you work on um, providing support that they're retained at our colleges. Um, so the, the last three methods have to do with a post-hiring process of things um, so that a, a di district might demonstrate that they provide professional development for faculty members, for example, to deepen their cultural competency as they interact with our very diverse students. Uh, diversity might be incorporated as a criteria for employee evaluation. We know that one of the minimum qualifications for every faculty position is understanding of diversity, and yet for some districts that may be the last time it's heard. And so there are districts that are providing that as um, a, a criteria for evaluation as they continue in their journey in our districts. And finally, the last multiple measure might be um, some of those grow your own programs, mentoring individuals once they are hired and encouraging our students to come back and teach at our institutions. So again, in order to compete for the funds in the future, a district will have to have an advisory committee in place and an EEO plan, and then they will certify that they meet at least five of the other eight uh, multiple measures. And this summer when the colleges report what they are doing, we're hoping to pick some of those best practices and create a handbook that we can disseminate to all the colleges. So that constitutes the four legs, the table of inclusion as we see it. Uh, and that concludes our report. Okay, thank you both for a very, uh, or all three of you, for a very comprehensive report. Uh, I wanted to open, are there any members of the public that have uh, taken out cards to uh, address this? I topic? have no cards on either of these items. Okay, um, members of the board, uh, uh, Member Sumner. I was just gonna say, I'm really excited about this, but that's why the scorecard I was gonna ask, when we will get this, you know, even if it's not wait till the next board meeting, I'd be really curious to see where the colleges are at, how we stand, and you know, because maybe it'll be a nice little competition offer for the colleges in the different districts. And 
you know, even like with the, the veterans. But, you know, so I think this is exciting. So I'm looking forward to seeing those scorecards and see how people try to, the colleges try to improve their own scorecards. Yes, we're, we're going to have a, a conference in March um, 14th through the 16th, and that'll be an opportunity for the colleges to come and really report out to each other and anyone else who's interested um, the kind of work that they're engaged in. You know, it's a little early for them to be reporting outcomes, but I think by the end of this semester, we'll have some significant outcomes to report. My uh, member, uh, Malia, I, I just want my one question for uh, Vice Chancellor Nolden is on the, uh, the equity plan. By, by law now, each district has to provide that equity plan. And then our, our, our office reviews it. Um, how, what, what, is, what is the incentive to have a good one? And what is the incentive to have one that just barely qualifies for <laughs> passing? <laughs> Besides the incentive of, of doing a better job of uh, serving your students. Well, I mean, I, are there any actual The, the fact that we're reading them probably is really really great incentive because I think in the past we may have submitted you know matriculation information mm -hmm. I'm sure I know when I was out in the field I didn't know if anyone ever really looked at it so no one ever really called me about it or said you're doing good or bad or, or what have you and I think with us uh, with the uh, scorecard and other ways that we are going to be able to measure the outcomes. I think that colleges know now that, you know, anyone can have access to this information and want to know how well you're doing with the community members that, that you serve in your respective districts. You know, is this a place I can send my son, daughter, cousin, or anyone else uh, to that I know that they're going to be well cared for and that people really understand them and know how to support their success. So I think that 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 really surprised people because when they found out that people were reading those reports, trust me, there was a lot of interest in, okay, well, uh, are they going to give us feedback? You know, how well are we going to be able to, are we going to have another, are we going to have a do-over, <laughs> you know, if we didn't do it well, that kind of thing. I so, appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. That's what I wanted to hear. Member Malliman. Um Well, thank you very much. I'm excited about the um, four legs, <laughs> and I think it'll be a great to help I'm excited about the pipeline. So um, I've learned that there's a former student of my husband up there. And he did, um, in Long Beach, uh, we had so much diversity that we needed more teachers. And uh, they started, he took his college students and had them reaching down into the high schools mm -hmm. to mentor and support them mm -hmm. to want to be teachers. Mm -hmm. And they were already bilingual mm -hmm. and uh, supported them all the way through. So I think that will be great. And I know there's programs out there. Um, and my question is, underneath that pipeline, there's the education code. What does that mean? Is there already uh, guidelines for this? Yeah, there's actually um, a statutory framework for this. So that code provision talks about the EEO fund, the $767,000 could be utilized for a creation of a pipeline program for our community colleges. Another statutory framework is a framework um, involving a, a loan forgiveness program, graduate loan forgiveness program mm -hmm. um, that um, hasn't has been defunded. Uh, but the statutory framework is still in place. Oh, wow. um, so uh, as you can imagine, there could be a, a more need for funding to light a little fire underneath uh, both of those statutory schemes. Right. And as I recall, they were guaranteed jobs in the school district. Um, there is a requirement that they come back and teach for three years. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things, you know, the, the graduate loan forgiveness doesn't talk about what the programming that could be done while they're at the community colleges. Mm -hmm. And that's the exciting part mm -hmm. with our partnership with the State Academic Senate is actually what can we do, some of the things that you talked about where they are starting to teach, learn, and coach and tutor while they're at the community college to kind of light that passion and that skill set. Um, and what do we do best? We do best in workforce training, right? So the whole point is at the community college to train them and prepare them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Member Shaw. Member Shaw. Hi. Um, you know, for many years I was an adjunct, adjunct professor at uh, USC, mm. political science department. So, and that really, in, at that institution, it was really a way of bringing in practitioners and also to diversify the faculty. So I don't understand how the adjuncts in our system are not are less diverse than the regular faculty. I don't. How did I, that, I think your how did that your puzzlement is um, shared by a lot of people when we brought this data out uh, to statewide and pointed out that our adjunct was less because 
almost everyone felt it was contrary to popular belief. But how did it happen? How does it happen? Then? Well, that hiring, that hiring is done at the, uh, in most cases, at the dean level. Those where those decisions are made. And as, as Twee points out, I think there was a sort of a broad uh, misconception that it was very diverse so that a given individual making those hires says, well, you know, it, it's generally very diverse. The fact that my unit is not, it's not that big a deal. Well, now it's increasingly clear to everybody that no, somebody else wasn't taking care of this. It's, it's your responsibility, and it's everybody's responsibility. So uh, I would imagine there is a national belief that adjunct faculty are more diverse. It's not just yeah. here in California. Uh -huh. And uh, through this work, people are beginning to realize that's simply not the case. Right. Again, that's the, the, the fact that we collected this data and actually have the data now to review is, is now w what I expect the system will do a little bit more careful uh, looking into this so that we can identify those reasons and then address them. Oh, I want to follow up on that. The question is, um, the data that we have, is it collected just one time? Is it going to be dynamic? Are we going to collect it again? What's the process with the data? I, I understand from our MISS group that the colleges are due to turn in their next set of data um, February. So we should have some data by the end of February of all the colleges. Great. And then I want to follow up. Um, so Vice Chancellor Nolan, um, the question I'm trying to understand, <clears throat> I think we spent $225 million or $255 million in student equity. The question is, are, are the funds working? Can you answer that? I, I would say they're working. I think the thing that happened is that the timing of when the colleges received the funds. So you had a couple things. There was a the timing uh, um, when they received the funds, and then the process you have to go to, through to build an infra infrastructure to begin to try to impact positive outcomes for these groups. It doesn't happen overnight. And um, you have situations where you, know, you have um, participatory governance processes that you have to go through to prioritize faculty hiring and, and staff hiring. And so you get it at a point in time where you've already prioritized that for that particular year. So this year, we're just now seeing many more positions being hired for of people who can actually do the equity work. Um, I think that there was probably in the first go round some idea that, well, you know, anybody could do equity work. Well, as I said earlier, if we knew the answers to solving the, the conundrum about why certain student groups are not performing as well as others, we probably would need student equity funding. So I think it became clear after people started looking at um, the outcomes that these students were experiencing that they did not have the wherewithal on the campus to really come up with um, plans that would address the, the disproportionate impact without going out and getting the information, bringing it back, uh, going through the process, a collaborative process of all of the people that needed to be in the room to discuss, leveraging your resources because there are a lot of resources that can be leveraged towards this. And then just the collaboration that happened as a result of it. Like I said, the faculty senate got on board and they did a lot of educating um, of faculty so that people would really begin to understand, well, do we have any best practices that we can use? Maybe let's try to do those first and then let's try to look at some other kinds of things that we can do. And I would just say the biggest thing is that it takes time. People want to be thoughtful. They want to develop uh, outcomes that they know that they can achieve and not just set a goal and then we talk about well we didn't achieve it and we really don't know why um, you know have the research capacity to provide the metrics so that we can really look at well what's going on here so I think all those things are gelling now and I think in the next year we'll start to see some really great things and I just lastly wanted to mention that we did some things statewide with Moja and with the HBCU that you know, we know a lot of our populations are disproportionately impacted on every metric statewide. So there are things that we can do statewide to help colleges leverage. Mm -hmm. And I would say probably about 40 of our colleges took students on uh, tours of historically black colleges and universities, which was really, the outcomes from that just anecdotally are amazing. So I think we're gonna see really great outcomes. Just so to, uh, can uh, I follow up? Yeah, yeah I just wanna, wanna echo something that yeah. you said just to, to end we're going to need to demonstrate a return on that investment if we are uh, going to continue to be able to go back to the governor and to the uh, legislature. So I, I, I appreciate the fact that we will hopefully continue to document progress in these areas uh, because otherwise we may lose that funding 
and not uh, have those same resources. You know? Yeah, I mean, that, was, that is my concern, right? And ultimately, you know, what I'm looking for is, is there a way to, you know, dive deeper, to take examples of, you know, five equity plans and follow them through the process of this is the data, this is where it started, this is the money we funded it with, this is the outcomes. That's kind of what I'm looking for to be able to talk to, you know, to right. the president's point around yeah. it is working. These right. are five data points that were five examples that it has worked. Well, each of the uh, each of the equity plans address each of the outcome met, uh, outcomes that each of the colleges uh, were to develop goals around. And this year will be the year where they give you the first report. Last year, we kind of did a do-over of the plan because we had to get a plan that we knew that colleges could actually carry out and that we could get some really um, consistent outcome data so we can compare, you know, across these groups that are disproportionately impacted. So I really, I really think that you're going to start to see the infrastructure being put on place on these campuses, folks hired that know how to work with these populations, folks who are currently on campus educating themselves to better meet the needs of the students that they currently have. And when all those things happen, I don't think you can help but move the needle because okay. everyone's on the same page. So one antidote I have is <clears throat> when I was talking to one of the presidents, he mentioned he used equity funds to actually provide uh, uh, Wi-Fi access on campus. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, I didn't mention anything. I didn't comment on it. But my point was, I don't know if that was the intent to that, right? So, so to me, I just feel like, we need to be more vigilant and, and really look at accountability. Well, that's why we're reviewing the plans, because when we see that uh, something like that, we immediately contact the college and we say, we don't really think that this is a good use of equity dollars. This is not going to get us where we need to be. And perhaps there was something that you didn't put in the plan that we could understand. How are you going to measure just our closed achievement gaps and measure who's using Wi-Fi to determine that the achievement gap was closed as a result of that? And again, it goes back to understanding what equity is. It's not equally giving someone money because you think that that's a need that you have on your campus because you could widen the gap. You know, if you're a student that you don't have a laptop computer, having a uh, Wi-Fi is not going to help you. Got it. Okay, thanks. M Member Sumner. I was just going to add, you know, and worth uh, bringing CTEs in this with the community inv involvement and the collaboration, I think, you know, the mentorship programs, I think, is huge. If there was any way to track um, the type of diversity we have within the mentors may offset some of the colleges that have some of the challenges. They might not have that diversity, but they do have a mentorship program that has a lot of diversity. So I don't know if there's somehow we can do something with that, but I, I know that a lot of the colleges have the mentorships, and you've got a lot of diversity within your mentorship program. So if there was somehow we could look into that somehow, I think that might help the community colleges and get the word out more with the community involvement, with more with the CTEs saying, hey, you know, we may not be as diverse as we want to be, but hey, within the community, we need your help. Come on board, and that can improve within their programs. So just a, just a thought. Member Burdick. Thank you. Um, the equity plan is one of the best things that's happened to our campus recently, I think. Probably as much uh, dynamic discussion came out of that as the basic skills, mm -hmm. um, partly because of the data. Uh, we started looking at data in an entirely new way. Um, we have a data team that meets regularly, and we started talking about it. We started roping people in all over the campus, and it was and it was really quite valuable. We found many things with our basic skills would be crossovers with these things, and so they gave us an additional impetus. It also gave us more buy-in, which was excellent, so we were very pleased with that. We were happy with the flexibility of the plans. Um, the one area that we keep coming up with is the demographic groups that we are tracking um, that they are not actually representing who's on our campus in many ways. Uh, we're missing the subcontinent uh, 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 students. We're missing uh, LBGT students. We are lumping Asian students into a lump um, and <laughs> instead of really looking at the fact that we're probably talking about at a minimum of 10 to 15 different, uh, different populations. Every time we do that, we lose opportunities for finding solutions to people who really could, you know, could use that improvement. Um, and I know a lot of that's regulatory, but I would like to see us start moving, maybe put some more flexibility into these plans so that people can look at, at additional demographics on their campus. Well, I think in some, some of the groups you mentioned, I know you don't have a means of collecting data to determine right. how many people you have, like the LG, right. uh, uh, T, 
LGBT. LGBTQ. <laughs> anyway, you know what I mean. Um, and I think part of the challenge is that we wanted people to look at those groups initially. And then if you don't see the disproportionate impact there, there's nothing that's, that says that you can't disaggregate data in a different way and make your case that way. So I would say if you have groups like in the Asian Pacific, we, we've told lots of colleges, disaggregate it. Because you may find that s some subgroup of that group is truly, you know, Pacific Island Islanders in most cases mm -hmm. are truly disproportionately <laughs> impacted, and you can certainly target your services to that particular population. So, uh, last word to um, Vice President Estelano. And I'll be brief. Um, uh, to our interim general counsel, this is a great presentation. I've seen a version of this a couple of times now, but it's still compelling, um, particularly when you start off with that report about closing the achievement gap by 20 to 50 percent by diversifying your faculty. So I think it's powerful. I also want to give a nod to this comprehensive approach with the four pillars or the four legs. It's outstanding. And then lastly, um, having a partner like the Academic Senate in this is essential. And I want to you know, uh, thank the Academic Senate for their support through all of these workshops. Um, it sort of goes to the same thing. You know, To get that equity money, you have to show outcomes. If we want to have additional faculty hiring, we have to have some outcomes on diversity in this big plug of money that we got this year. If we don't show results this time, I can tell you that this legislature is not going to probably be so excited about providing additional faculty hiring money. So I think the Academic Senate has a really great attitude towards it, and I know the CEOs are, are also committed to this. So I think uh, uh, Tui, you've done a terrific job wrapping everything together. And the way you all did the presentation, builds on each other. This directly affects the achievement gap by dealing with diversity on the faculty hiring. So thank you. So our printed presentations, we're missing the even numbered pages. So yeah. if you want to email it to uh, uh, the we'll board, I don't print any extra copies, but you can email it to the yes. board if, uh, if people would uh, be able to refer to that. And uh, we also posted it online for it, the viewing Okay, public. so you can send a link to the online to the yes. board. We're going to now uh, recess into closed session. We will not reconvene in public session until 9 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, and where we will continue. Uh, Chancellor, did you One, have One uh, final item. I, w I do. We are on uh, television. I do want to go on record as saying this evening's reception that will be held later on will have no business whatsoever. It is a purely social activity. So, and for your information, closed session is in the uh, uh, conference room on the left. Okay. We are recessing to closed session, and we'll reconvene in the morning.